Well, hello and welcome to this uh, lunch panel on entrepreneurship. And uh, someone once told me that the worst thing a policymaker or a venture capitalist can do is turn an excellent researcher into a lousy entrepreneur. And the question in this panel, among several that we'll address, is uh, can we turn an excellent researcher into an excellent entrepreneur? And so what does it take you know, to go and um, make the decision to actually step out of the lab and take all these wonderful technologies uh, that um, all of us develop every day and turn it into products and services that really can make a difference in people's lives and ultimately change the world? So among all of the things that we've learned, what are those things that are really useful? What are those things that uh, you know, make it harder for us to learn the lessons that we need to learn to be successful uh, on our path towards creating a high growth, high risk business? And so to discuss all of these uh, issues with you, um, we have a very diverse group of uh, people. Uh, we don't have any women, unfortunately, so not that diverse. Um, but we do have uh, someone like uh, uh, Sriram, who uh, started, co-founded a company uh, and is now back in academia. We have uh, someone uh, like uh, Tom, who actually uh, was able to experience the whole cycle from starting a company until uh, acquisition. Uh, we have uh, uh, myself who founded uh, uh, two startups and am now the CEO of a Series A uh, company. Uh, we have Vinit who is uh, keeping uh, producers and uh, script writers honest uh, as they um, work on the next chapter of Silicon Valley, the famous um, HBO series. Uh, and we have Nagraj who, uh, uh, as uh, uh, head of Qualcomm Ventures, sees every day uh, entrepreneurs uh, making mistakes, learning from them, and, and, and can see patterns of how uh, you know, this path can look like. Um, and so it will be very informal and open. I would love for you to participate as much as possible. Uh, to provide a little bit of context, each of us is taking a few minutes uh, to give uh, you know, uh, a personal view uh, of this topic, um, and then we'll just open the floor for discussions. Um, and so we'll go from right to left, and we'll just start with Vinny. Right. That's stage right to stage left. Right. <laughs> so let me open up my slides here. Okay, so that's my name, I'm Vineeth. Uh, I'm an IBM researcher, I'm a research staff member of their Almaden lab. Uh, not the Yorktown one, fortunately. Um, and you might be wondering what is an IBM researcher doing on a panel about startups? Um, and you would be right to ask that question. But first, a little bit of background about what I do. So there's basically three segments you can do this, you can, you can segment this with. So there's the stuff that I do that's, you could say, pure research in some sense. It doesn't really tie into any products. And for me, this is largely existing at the intersection of data compression and machine learning, or more generally, information theory and uh, data science. Um, then there's stuff that ties in with IBM products and IBM stuff. Um, and this is largely around the world of knowledge graphs. So essentially extracting concepts from unstructured data and embedding these concepts in graphs of human knowledge and then you know, doing all sorts of fun stuff on those graphs. Um, and there's a third category which is becoming more and more popular these days. Um, and I put IBM Watson in quotes because this is largely public facing stuff um, that sort of skips the whole product life cycle entirely and is designed purely just to see what the public can make of our technology. Um, so for instance, in December-ish, I, uh, I worked on a little bit of uh, taking text from screenplays from the Lord of the Rings movies and from the Lord of the Rings novels um, and quantified exactly how uh, Peter Jackson tainted uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's vision. Um, so this is, again, just sort of an, an overview of my background, um, but nothing from this suggests my you know, credibility to be on this panel. Um, and while I have been you know, involved either in consulting and working roles for startups in the past, uh, the reason I'm here is because of my involvement over the past year and a half um, in what's essentially an invisible co-founder role um, in, a, in a startup that's gotten a lot of public attention um, over the past year. Uh, and I'm speaking, of course, of Pied Piper, um, <laughs> which some of you may recognize as a fictional startup from HBO's television series, Silicon Valley, 
um, which, is, which has been a crazy surreal ride. But essentially, they chose data compression out of all the fields uh, to be the area for a breakthrough. And they chose it, um, and this will be news for the source coders in the room, because uh, they thought of data compression as a dead field that needed rejuvenation. Um, and what's interesting is that um, they didn't just want the standard technical consulting involvement here. So, I mean, of course, there was uh, coming up with dialogue and, and figures for whiteboards and instructions for what to point at, that sort of thing. Um, but what they were going for was a little bit deeper. They wanted to connect with the audience at the end with the technical concepts that these you know, these founders and these engineers are dealing with, um, specifically compression and information theory. Um, and I think they, they did a pretty good job of that. Um, but they wanted to go one step beyond that as well. Um, not only did they want to touch the audience, but they also wanted to bring this back to the community and use the show as kind of a lightning rod to bring attention towards data compression, um, both from researchers and from VCs even, um, and industry. Uh, most recently, they actually helped us organize the Stanford Compression Forum, where we had you know, about 50-odd academics and researchers coming together um, to, as we hope, uh, jumpstart a new era of compression research. Um, or at least that's what we told IBM, who paid for it. Um, in any case, that's, that's me. I'll hand over the mic. <laughs> hey. Hello, everybody. My name is Sriram Vishwanath, and I've also, in recent years, um, jumped into this uh, entrepreneurship, understanding entrepreneurship, uh, both from in terms of research and in terms of what is relevant to marketing. And I would say it is super exciting, especially as an information theory researcher, as somebody who uh, spends a lot of time thinking about uh, aspects of applied probability and statistics, entrepreneurship is exciting, it's ideas in action, and I believe that it is very well suited for people who have the mindset that we do uh, because of the toolkit we bring to the problem. Now, um, the title, I, I want to emphasize uh, what I've put up there, which is market-driven um, ideas in action. Um, there is a lot, even though there's a lot of abstract thinking that we do, understanding the market and relating with it and turning ideas that are required in the market into action is very much our forte. Um, I would argue that we can do this better than many other communities out there. And so that's what I want to show you in this presentation. So I've had the opportunity of doing this um, three times in the recent past, um, and I'm going to show you each one. So your core is information and theory and statistics, probability. And this core helps bring about Ideas, and one natural idea is communicational networking. It's something we tie in as information theorists and applied information theorists very well into that domain. And I was fortunate uh, to be involved in the founding of M87, uh, which is actually funded by Qualcomm Ventures. Um, M87 is a very exciting uh, startup that does dynamic meshing, D2D, uh, at a, in a very seamless fashion, taking care of all the aspects of billing, security, uh, reliability, and improvement in coverage and capacity, as well as the back-end analytics needed to do so. So it, it, this is a natural fit for us. It's something that uh, you would say would be an application that is familiar to our domain. Um, but I believe there's much, much more that can go with an information theorist in terms of other applications you could be involved in. The second application what, that I'm actually currently uh, CEO of is uh, in healthcare informatics. Um, I was fortunate to co-found, and my model has largely been working with PhDs and postdocs that um, live and breathe this through research, through development, and then to see if there is a meaningful match with a market uh, pain. If there is something that makes sense in the marketplace that is a fit for technology rather than the reverse, rather than taking a technology to market, understand the market and see if there's a technology that makes sense, um, then you bring it about in the form of a company. So Accordion Health was co-founded by me and my students last year, and what it does is healthcare informatics for managed care and accountable care organizations. Uh, if you're familiar with the ACA, which is also called Obamacare, there's a lot of emphasis on managed care and what Accordion Health does is it shows you for, for um, 
uh, a, a direct analogy shows you what your hospital bill means if you've ever been hospitalized, uh, why the charges are the way they are, um, and what, how much is controlled by the facility, the physician, and so on. So it, it gives you a certain degree of transparency uh, and accountability within healthcare. All right. Um, but this, again, is a natural fit. Uh, you might say, what have I got to do with healthcare informatics? I don't, I'm not a physician. I don't know healthcare. But the toolkit that we bring to the problem, uh, there's a lot of data mining machine learning. There's a lot of probabilistic analysis. Uh, and there's a lot of understanding that goes into how do you infer and understand in a predictive fashion uh, what costs and outcomes are going to be like in healthcare. You, again, it's, there's a big learning curve in understanding what the domain is. But when it comes to understanding the market pain and relating that with the toolkit that we have, which is information theory, there is a lot each one of us can do. So I had this opportunity, and subsequent to that, I worked uh, with a set of students, again, my PhD students, in the domain of machine vision. And what we built was a real-time 3D camera. And the company is called Lynx Laboratories. And I'm going to play one segment of what the company does. Um, which is real-time motion capture. They also do real-time 3D modeling. You can 3D model yourself. Uh, you can't hear the music, I think. And then you can superpose it on. So um, again, you might say machine vision, 3D, what has that got to do with information theory? And I would argue that it does have a lot to do with information theory because what was done was a probabilistic model, a probabilistic uh, high dimensionality reduction that really helped represent 3D in 2.5D and then enable motion capture, enable scene capture, scene understanding, enable object modeling, and so on. So there's various capabilities that uh, Lynx Laboratories has. Uh, all of which were, again, research. And the application here is to everything from use of video games uh, to uh, that's, that's one of the big applications. But there's many other applications as well, um, including uh, real estate and uh, uh, damage detection and so on. So um, what am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say there is many, many applications. And I think there is a lot of future for information theory going into additional sectors. And one, I would think, is just predictive intelligence when it comes to a lot of different commodity markets, um, when it comes to emerging spaces where predictive intelligence could play a big role. And also in Internet of Things, it's the uh, hot topic. This would come off the communication networking line. Uh, there is a lot to do for us in that space. And this is not just for software engineers, not just for people who do uh, system stuff, but for people who understand both the theory side of things and systems, there is a lot to do uh, in general. So a lot of opportunities for us. Thank you. All right. So my name is Jean Barus. Um, in 2011, uh, my life changed substantially. I had gone back to my um, home city, uh, Porto, and taken a, a professor position at the University of Porto, Portugal. Um, and this was at the time where Portugal was actually investing uh, a lot of money in science and technology. And I, I actually declined an offer from Georgia Tech to go back home because I wanted to be part of that, of building you know, uh, uh, a scientific community in, in Portugal. Um, and everything went great until the financial crisis hit. And suddenly, uh, Portugal was uh, in a very, very, very difficult financial situation situation with the euro crisis, and everything suddenly was about cuts, uh, spending cuts, uh, austerity measures. Um, and on October 23, 2011, I saw uh, in disbelief the Prime Minister of Portugal cutting my salary by 23%. And I thought, hmm, <laughs> so here I am. I, we're 
building, you know, uh, uh, something that Portugal never had before, actually, a strong, vibrant scientific community. We're qualifying all these young people, and our unemployment rate, you know, is hitting the roof in terms of more than 40%. Uh, and we, we have to do something, we have to do something about this. Um, at the same time, uh, I, I, I was working uh, on uh, building networks of connected vehicles. Um, for a very simple reason. As, as a researcher, uh, right after my PhD, I was intrigued by how much uh, physical data could you actually take uh, to the internet uh, in, in, in a reliable way. And, and one way was to put all these sensors in fixed locations and then send the data using the cellular network. But that didn't seem like a really good idea because it was very expensive uh, and very limited in the amount of uh, data that you could actually collect and send. So with a colleague who was interested in transportation, we started thinking about can we use vehicles as mobile sensors to gather data. And we did uh, uh, some theoretical work, a bunch of computer simulations, and then eventually we thought uh, computer simulations can only bring us this far. Uh, we should build a system like this. And so we talked with a local taxi company in uh, Porto, uh, this was back in 2009, um, and we knew that uh, uh, the IEEE 802.11p standard, also known as the SRC, was in the works. Uh, so we bought a few really expensive uh, radios from NEC at the time to start doing experiments in the 5.9 gigahertz band, and we uh, tried to understand uh, how this vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle technology and vehicle-to-infrastructure uh, could actually help us bring more data uh, from the physical world, remember, using vehicles as mobile sensors, to the cloud uh, and using the existing Wi-Fi infrastructure instead of depending entirely on, on cellular. We started working with the taxis and it was really hard because uh, cab drivers in Porto own their own vehicles uh, and at the same time, uh, the uh, link board devices that we were using from NEC were way too expensive. Uh, and we wanted to build a large network so that we could actually do sampling across the whole city. Uh, so then a colleague of uh, ours in Aveiro uh, said, oh, I think I can do an 802.11p radio that uh, you know, is cheaper than what those guys are charging you. Uh, so we took six months to actually build a little box that had cellular, 802.11p and Wi-Fi, uh, and then we were able to get a grant from the European Commission and manufacture it in such a way that we could equip 100 taxis. And so we started data gathering and, and uh, developing the networking software that you needed to be able to decide which link are you going to send, what data do you need to send in real time, what data can you cache and send later, how can you do a mesh of that uh, uh, those vehicles to improve coverage. Um, and then I found a serious problem, which was 100 taxis in a city with 41 square kilometers uh, makes it really hard uh, you know, to build a mesh because they only see each other uh, uh, every so often. Uh, so I was talking with a friend uh, in a different university uh, uh, about this, and he said, well, you know, a friend of mine from school, uh, his father owns a trucking company, uh, and they work in the port. Why don't you talk with them? And so I went to the port, and I will never forget this moment when I saw all these trucks with containers just going around, and all the cranes and all the boats, and everything was moving right in front of me at high density, uh, and it just seemed perfect. So I talked with the uh, uh, trucking company uh, and asked them, you know, would you mind if we put, you know, a couple of devices in your trucks? And he said, sure, yeah, just go ahead and, and do it. And so we put our little devices and we actually had a vehicular mesh network at high density because they always have these 30 trucks that go every day carrying uh, the containers back and forth. And one day, I was uh, talking with the guy who owned, owned that company, uh, and I showed him, see, I can see your uh, trucks. Here they are. And I said, you can see our trucks? And he said, yes, I can see. Here, here, here they are. And, I said, and, and he said, well, you know, we've been trying to get that for years. We tried uh, with uh, a small device that has GPRS uh, and, and sends the data, and it didn't work. We tried with Wi-Fi, and it didn't work, but your system is able to tell us where where they are how does that work and so that's when I realized that this whole industry was still you know uh, uh, pretty far away from what we take for granted with our smartphones and with our uh, network so we started working 
with them to develop an infrastructure, real-time uh, data infrastructure for them. We start building and building, and then eventually uh, they started asking us, oh, but can you add this, and can we have a nice platform where we can see it? And then we showed them, uh, <laughs> this is how much time your tr trucks are spending idle with the engine on, and that was a really eye-opener, and eventually uh, we had a product and they wanted to buy the system for their real-time operations. So at, Muriel Medard invited me then at MIT to give a, a, a talk about connected vehicles. Uh, and uh, I, I gave the talk about our, our, our experiments. And a lady who used to be uh, uh, with Intel Capital was in the audience. And she came to me and said, uh, you have to do two things. Uh, one is you have to start a company. And two, you have to talk with Robin Chase. And I had no idea who Robin Chase was, so I, I Googled her. And Robin Chase was the founder and former CEO of Zipcar uh, in, in the US, and she lives in Boston. Uh, and, and the lady from Intel Capital said, you know, when you're ready, uh, uh, let me know, and I'll, I'll make an introduction. And so when I finally felt ready to talk with uh, a successful entrepreneur like, like Robin Chase, uh, this lady actually sent a very nice email with the subject title, uh, uh, the answer to a question you asked me three years ago. And the question that Robin had asked was, do you know anybody who can build a network of vehicles? And the reason why Robin was so intrigued with, by this was that uh, when they launched Zipcar in 2000, AT&T didn't have a cell data plan, so they had to deal with all sorts of uh, connectivity issues. Um, and she gave a TED talk in 2007 where she said that every vehicle should be a Wi-Fi hotspot. And then I thought, when I saw this TED talk on YouTube, I thought, wow, well, that's exactly what we're doing in, in Porto. So we connected, and then eventually uh, I met her uh, in Silicon Valley, of all places, because I was doing some consulting for Cisco, and she happened to be there. And we met uh, in the train station of Palo Alto in the little Cafe Venecia, and after two hours we had a sketch of a business plan, and we decided to start Venium together. And uh, the company has taken over my life, so I'm on leave from the University of Porto. Sever several of you have mentioned that they haven't seen me in the last two years. Well, we were stealth and we were building uh, what is today the largest vehicular mesh network in the world. It has the entire public bus fleet uh, in uh, Porto, t the taxis, uh, garbage collection trucks. We're offering free Wi Fi and public transit to 95,000 people, uh, offloading traffic from cellular uh, to Wi Fi, and gathering lots of data. Uh, for, for people to use. And I way extended my, my time, but I'll show you this video just briefly so that you get an idea of how you go from, you know, a few connected vehicles to actually a city scale network. To be connected in today's world means that no matter where I am, I don't have to think about whether it'll be a black hole, whether I'm paying extra money, whether I will have connectivity or not. I will just always know for sure that it's a seamless connection, whether I'm on a bus, on the street, in my office, in a city that I don't know, I'm always connected. So those are the buses. The network is more valuable when it is everywhere. Just like we expect electricity to be everywhere, we should expect uh, network connection to recognizes that the internet is evolving to an immense ecosystem that connects millions of people and very soon, billions of things. Most of these things will be constantly moving. Venium is building the networking fabric for the internet of moving things. Our hardware, software, and cloud components allow vehicles and other moving things to connect to each other and share data with the internet. This is what we call ubiquitous information, ubiquitous communication. So everything will be connected, to everything will be communicating with everything. So this is our vision. The vibrant city of Porto, Portugal fulfilled the key requirements for becoming the first deployment of Venium's technology, a living lab that proved the capability and scalability of Venium solutions. In the process, Porto became home to the largest vehicular network in the world, offering mobile hotspots to more than 50,000 end users. Venium's network in Porto already has hundreds of vehicles, including taxis, garbage collection trucks, and the entire fleet of public buses. These vehicles not only serve as mobile Wi-Fi hotspots, but they also gather terabytes of data which they send from the physical world to the cloud. 
just a way to monitor the city with the use of technology, with the use of sensors, and so Venium provides the back-end infrastructure for that. Beyond delivering the hardware, software, and cloud components for networks of connected vehicles, Venium is building the networking platform that will ultimately enable the Internet of Moving Things. <coughs> After proving the concept in Europe, we set up our headquarters in Mountain View, California. This allows us to address the U.S. and world markets and brings us one step closer to realizing the dream of a global Internet of Moving Things. An Internet of Moving Things. <laughs> oh, season two, uh, season two. That's not what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone take a picture? No. <laughs> You'll get me in trouble. Okay. All right, and you're an untitled folder. This is it, right? Okay. okay. <laughs> So good morning, everybody. Um, hopefully, all of you saw the play yesterday. So you've already actually um, heard about Flareon. Uh, Rajiv was in the play. So, so um, and many of you already know a lot of the history of Flareon, so I'm not going to repeat it. And it's all ancient history. I have nothing to push anymore. So let me just uh, give you a bit of my personal experience um, that might be relevant to the topic of this panel. So in uh, 1999, um, it was the dot-com bubble. So. The idea of doing a startup was in the air. Everyone wanted to get rich quick. And uh, so there, at the time, I had two projects that I was involved in, both of which uh, were going to spin out and become startups. And I was faced with the dilemma of choosing. So one of them was a um, holographic data storage project. And they spun out as a company called InPhase Technology in 2000. And the other was this idea of uh, a new generation of, of wireless technology for data, internet technology. And it was actually a very tough decision. I'd actually been much more involved in the holographic data storage project. And um, the main claim to fame there from Bell Labs' perspective was they developed a special chemistry for the material that was going to be used to store the holograms. And there were a lot of issues with, uh, with the project, I mean, trying, I mean, with the technology. You had to develop a whole new kind of drive. Uh, there were materials, manufacturing, and so on. The, the Flareon idea was also extremely ambitious. They wanted to be the next Qualcomm take over the wireless world, become the uh, new generation of technology for the wireless internet. So both of them had huge visions in common. I felt that you know, my personal skills were better suited to the wireless technology. I was a little bit worried about all the mechanical issues associated with uh, the holographic data storage. Um, there was a joke that we used to make fun of. Uh, so in holographic data storage, at holographic data storage, is the storage technology of the future, and it always will be. <laughs> and, there's a, and then there's, unfortunately, for uh, in phase, there's a kernel of truth in that store in that joke. So anyway, I joined Flareon, and uh, that was 2000. And uh, another thing, I, since most people know this a uh, lot about the story of Flareon, rather than elaborate on that, I wanted to mention that within Flareon there was kind of a sm another entrepreneurial effort, small sort of side business. So I was able to take the work that um, we'd done in coding uh, on the theoretical side with Rudy. And uh, in Flareon, we developed hardware and also design tools and so on. And we were able, for example, to control the air floor. So we managed to connect up with Mac Store and uh, sold a um, coding solution 
for hard drives to Maxor, and eventually Maxor was acquired by Seagate, and, and eventually uh, the solution actually appeared in products. And that was a very sort of exciting mini entrepreneurial experience for me inside Flareon. And um, that was a, so that was just one of the many sort of products that Flareon developed. And being in a startup gave me sort of tremendous flexibility to be able to maneuver quickly, and if we had something to just try to uh, find a, a business outlet for it. So. I want to mention that, and Flareon itself, of course, was a tremendous experience. The company uh, existed from 2000 to 2006 when it was acquired by Qualcomm. Of course, you know, like many startups, there were big ups and downs. Has a happy ending, so uh, that's a good thing. I just want to mention maybe a few things that a few key points in, in the history of the company. So one was um, the Nextel deal. So next, so. Flaring was bringing a disruptive technology to the market, and fortunately for us, in a way, there was kind of a maverick operator inside the market already, which was Nextel. They had unusual spectrum holdings, kind of a dead-end technology, uh, and, and a very sort of niche business. And so they, so we engaged with them, and they, um, they set up a big demo of technology in Rally. A lot of operators came through. The technology was really, really great, in my opinion. So there's a few. Key high points that I remember uh, that stand out the most in my mind from the Flareon experience. One was the day Andy Viterbi joined the board. That was a huge change. It kind of, I and mean, we already, of course, had a lot of faith in the company, but it, it, it grew 10 dB that day. And the other was uh, this 90 terabytes per month. So the Flareon technology had one, uh, a couple of deployments. One of them was um, in Slovakia. Slovakia didn't have very good internet service, and they sold the technologies. It's a box that would sit on your desk and connect to the internet. And that was done by T-Mobile. And that network in Slovakia was carrying 90 terabytes a month, which was more data than the entire rest of the T-Mobile network combined. So that's something that you know, we take pride in that and helps to put Flareon in perspective, at least in my mind. And um, so as it happened, uh, Nextel, of course, was acquired by Sprint, and then their plans changed. Uh, we had other we had plan B, and um, we were following through on that, but Qualcomm had the wisdom to uh, acquire us before uh, we got too far out of the bag, so to speak. So I, I don't have any exciting stories, so I don't have a presentation. I do? We, do. we may have a so video yeah, for you. Yeah, so I, I uh, as we talked about, Qualcomm came up a few times. Uh, I'm the Qualcomm in-house VC, so I, uh, my job is made very fun by all the entrepreneurs here. I actually don't have a job without entrepreneurs. So that's why I think it's very exciting to see a lot of folks who are potential entrepreneurs here. So I definitely encourage people to try to step out uh, of the lab. Uh, for us specifically, you know, we have funded around 130 companies now active. 130 companies active uh, across seven geographies. The kind of companies that folks here would fund, we typically look for in the US, mm -hmm. Israel, Europe, uh, a little bit in Korea, in places like India, China, Brazil, there's more of a business model innovation rather than true technical innovation. Uh, you know, we, we touched upon a lot of different kinds of companies here. The, the advice I would generally give, I think few people actually mentioned that is, there's a lot of hard problems to be solved, but generally, folks coming out of university may not be domain experts. So teaming up with a domain expert uh, as a co-founder or somebody who can be an advisor uh, to help you put your technologies to work is, I think, the best case scenario. I mean, if you look at Qualcomm, it's the best example of a university professor starting a company that's now a 100 billion plus uh, company, so professor. Well, Dr. Irvin Jacobs came over from MIT to UCSD and then you know, founded Qualcomm. So that's like the great example. But those kind of opportunities uh, where there's a fundamental shift in, in telecommunications are, are not that easy to find anymore. It's uh, obviously those are very big opportunities and, and Dr. Jacobs took advantage of that. Tom was part of at least some of that trend also. Th those are hard to find. But what's now sort of in favor with the VC crowd, and I'm not saying it's just uh, not speaking just for, for corporate VCs, we are actually a little bit more broader in our, the way we look at things, we'll look at fundamental technologies, but if you look at the, the vast majority of VCs today, they hesitate in, fu in funding what I would call 
uh, core research or, or applied research, companies that are based on that, they're more interested in the end user applications, whether it's social media, consumer devices. So one way to think about it is all of these have very hard problems that data scientists can solve. And that's the kind of techniques that uh, all of you in the room here can add to. So if you add that or application of that in the consumer space that you can solve, I think those are the kinds of companies that are getting funded today. So just purely from a, not what interests you, but taking what interests you and applying to a field that's getting funded. That I think is the key part of advice. I would say a lot of the VC funding in the US has moved away from what I would call funding companies like what Qualcomm did or what uh, Flareon did. Uh, I think uh, to, to a large extent, these are companies that take normal times to, to, uh, to work out. So they take seven to eight years, which used to be normal in the old days. Nowadays, VCs are not looking to fund companies that take seven years to exit. They're looking for companies that may exit in a couple of years to Google, Twitter, Facebook. And those are not generally fundamental innovations. They, fundamental innovations take a longer time to, uh, to take hold. So that's sort of, the, I think, the shift in what's happened since some of the uh, companies are based on core technologies being funded. That's sort of a little bit of a shift in the VC market. The dollars have actually gone away. And I think there's a little bit of a, I would say, fear that the art of investment in core technology and semiconductor may actually forever go away from Silicon Valley. It's possible that in 10 years, we will have nobody in Silicon Valley that knows how to fund a startup that's based on core tech. So that's sort of the, my doomsday scenario. But I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity between now and, and then, especially as I said, if you can use technologies and apply. I think one example, we, had, uh, we have a, a summit every year where we invite all our portfolio companies. And we had Cynthia, Dr. Cynthia Brazil from MIT speak. You know, she has taken fundamental AI techniques and, and started Jibo. If, you, if you've seen, you can Google it up. And it's a consumer device that's sort of an intelligent consumer device in the home. And that's got very fundamental AI techniques that she's been working on for a number of years. And so that got funded. They had no problem getting funding. It was actually uh, multiple rounds of funding. Again, things that essentially have a connection to the consumer in one form, and then you can use at the back fundamental technology to bring that to market is things that the VCs are funding today. So I think that's sort of, uh, I'll, I'll close uh, on that note. And if there's any questions, obviously, we'll take them. Well, that concludes our initial round of introductions and setting the stage for what will hopefully be, be a flood of questions uh, from the other side of the room. So uh, the floor is open. And we look forward to hearing your questions. So the first one. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so let's say I have an idea. What should I do next? All right. So who do you want to ask this question to? <laughs> you talk with N N Nagra. Okay. <laughs> Typically, I think you know. Again, when you say you have an idea. Uh, you need to convince yourself that sort of solving a pain point or it has a, some kind of a big market opportunity if you're successful because there's a lot of things between having an idea and making it successful. But if it is successful, then you have to convince yourself that's a big market. Once you convince yourself, then you actually go and meet some friends and family who have maybe more advanced in their career and can afford to lend you some money. So I think that's typically the way a lot of these things get started. Uh, either you max out your credit card bill or you get some friends or family and then you figure out what exactly uh, how do you apply that idea? Is it a prototype that you can show off to some people? Is that an algorithm that you apply somewhere else? Is that a, a mobile app that you develop? So something you have to develop either on your own dime or with a close set of friends and family who trust you and are willing to give you a shot. Typically, after that stage is when you would actually go try to raise some kind of capital. You might get, try to get a co-founder at that time, friends you work with, uh, colleagues in, in the university. But you really need to sort of build up maybe a two to three person team and then go out look for some funding. And when I say funding at that stage would be typically still, we'd call it a seed round. So you'd look for something in the 250K to a million range. And now there's a, there's a huge amount of uh, firms that provide that kind of capital. There's actually an explosion at that stage. Uh, typically, again, depending on where you are, I would advise, I mean, the first step uh, is Easiest access to capital, uh, for better or for worse, is in Northern California. So I think if you're not there, then you, 
is it's worth visiting to figure out, tap into some of the networks there. And it's become much easier now. I mean, to raise the early rounds, if the idea is promising, has become much, much easier. Except that, I, as I said, and I think at that stage, they're not going to take a risk on an idea that takes seven, eight years to come to fruition. They just are not conditioned to do that. So you just have to figure out uh, where, where you think that they can, you can convince them, look, uh, if you invest now, uh, the people who come after you will invest at a higher valuation, and it won't take hundreds of millions of dollars to bring it to market. Because if it does, then the folks who are investing very upfront cannot invest again, and they get wiped out. So there's a lot of different things uh, have to be worked. But if you have an idea, at least start with uh, putting together a small amount of money from friends and family and from your from your own accounts, and then prove prove out to yourself, and then that you can something to show somebody. What, what was really helpful for, for, for my team uh, was um, that uh, MIT runs a venture competition in Europe, and it's part of the MIT Portugal uh, program, but it's open to uh, entrepreneurs from, from all over the world. And so initially they had 132 startups, and they selected uh, 20 startups that over a course of eight months would compete with each other, not in terms of, you know, is presenting a business plan, but actually with mentors from uh, Sloan School of Management at MIT, uh, we would get uh, homework on a weekly basis and we had Skype calls. Uh, and it was all about, you know, go test the market. So, so you think you have a solution for connected vehicles? So how are you going to get to a critical mass? Uh, are you going for consumers? Are you going for fleets? If you're going to fleets, go talk to fleets. Do they need this or is cellular enough? Do they have coverage problems? Don't they? How much are they willing to pay for that? And just, and so just, uh, that was a big mind shift for me because it was not about the technology at all. So they just took for granted that we're smart engineers. We can make the technology work, <laughs> but now show us that actually someone uh, you know, can use uh, that to, to either reduce costs or increase profits. Uh, and so figure out uh, how to do it. And that was great over the course of eight months. They, they got from 20 to four, and then eventually we won the venture competition, which was very nice because it came with a nice uh, um, uh, amount of money as, as, as uh, venture debt that we could owe for many years. And, and that kind of got us started. And by that time, also, we had this pitch that was convincing enough then to get the angel investment uh, and I think for that, that transition, uh, that, that part was, was, was really important for me. The other one was to team up with people that had done that before uh, and that were also asking the, 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 the hard questions. Uh, and, and the hard questions is ultimately who is going to pay for it. Um, and you quickly become very aware of the importance of money. Because as academics, sometimes we say, oh, money, that's a dirty thing. We don't talk about money. But at the end of the day, it's money that pays the salaries at the end <laughs> of the month. And so very quickly, it becomes clear that, you know, you have, you get this money from your investors and every month, especially as CEO or, or CFO, you just see the money going down and down and down and down. And so eventually you feel the urge to make sure that some comes in so it doesn't only go down. Uh, and then you'll still have other rounds and we closed a Series A round with True Ventures and Union Square Ventures that gives us, you know, expands our runway to get to the next level. But immediately, you know, the challenges of the next <laughs> round come up and you still have to prove all sorts of things. The good thing is that for a lot of that, you need to uh, um, actually do your homework and understand, get, gather information, process information, talk with a lot of people. And so many of the skills that you learn as a researcher, as Sriram was mentioning, are useful. Uh, it's just that the setting changes completely and acceleration programs, mentors help a lot in, in doing that. Um, I would we could very much, I would very much agree. I, I just want to add to one aspect. Um, um, that I, I, it's become sort of a philosophy for me now, which is this whole fake it till you make it, which is you don't really build a product first. Uh, the technology, you have the idea, presumably it can be worked out, but you want to figure out if it's a consumer product or it's a business product. You're selling to businesses or consumers. And then you want to hit the street. Um, you want to build something that looks very much like the product, either it's a, it's a one pager that says, these are the specs of the product, this is how it will work. And then you want to do a lot of listening. Right? So when I say hit the street, if it's a consumer product, I really mean hit the street. Go hit the street, show it to them and say, more, will you get this? Will you take this? Will you spend afternoons on the street saying, do you want this? But it is less being leading. It's not pitching to them saying, by the way, this is so cool. Do you, do you, will you take this? It is much more 
does this address something that you would go, oh my, if only I had that, right? And then, here's the thing, even with the business side, you want a cold call, right? This is not a time to be shy. Cold call, 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 call. Get on the phone and call. And call and say, here's the spec sheet of what I'm trying to build. Is this something you want? What would you change on it, right? Uh, it's sort of, you want to definitely ask questions, but it's a lot of listening to make sure that actually is what the market wants. Um, I've seen a few successful entrepreneurs set up portals where people would sign up for the product and reach a very high level of sign up even before they've started writing a line of code to build that product. The main reason is you, it, it's sort of what crowd funding does for you, but it is sort of trying to understand in the consumer space or in the business space, is there enough traction that your product will get uh, before you have to actually go down the road of building it? Oh, yes. Uh, you mentioned money. Your last comment was about... Your last comment was about money. Uh, how do you monetize a, a service when you give away the transceiver? That's part one. Part two, uh, you seem to favor Wi-Fi, and that seems to be a, a new service that's great. Uh, but there is a company that I think is worldwide called Waze that is doing similar things with cellular, but maybe not so similar. Maybe you can comment on that. Happy to. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me start with the second question. Uh, so when you look at, at smartphones, uh, they actually have sensors, they have cellular, they have processing power, uh, but they also have a very small battery, and they have a user who has to install an app and, and have to be able to do that. Now look at the vehicle. A vehicle already comes with 100 sensors. Uh, if the vehicle is a Wi-Fi hotspot, you can add very cheap sensors, cameras, whatever kind of sensors you want in an unlimited way to the vehicle. Uh, it has an unlimited battery, it just keeps recharging. Uh, and as the vehicles go around, uh, they're machines, so they don't care about uh, uh, having to have an app, install it, run it, uh, and, and, and so on. So the type of data that you can collect and, uh, is, is much larger than with a smartphone and the cost of bringing that data to the cloud using Wi-Fi is a fraction uh, of what uh, it costs through cellular. When you look today at what telcos are charging transportation companies for uh, data, it's about $15 per gigabyte. And if you send it through access points using the fixed infrastructure, and we're talking about Wi-Fi for vehicles, so 802.11p, which has uh, 10 times the range of normal Wi-Fi, and uh, switching times of milliseconds, um, then uh, the cost comes down from $15 per gigabyte to, to less than um, 50 cents per gigabyte. And so for the same amount of money, you can bring so much more data to the cloud that you then can provide as uh, services, as streams, that others can build apps like Waze and others on top of those data streams that you provide from the cloud. And that's the business model. Now to your question, uh, who, who, we do charge for the devices and the transceivers. Uh, transport to get to a critical mass of vehicles, we quickly realized that we have to start with fleets uh, rather than consumers. And, that's, and then when you look, it's just, 18% of vehicles uh, uh, in, in a typical city, but it's 55% of the travel miles because they're always going around the buses, the taxis, the garbage collection truck, delivery trucks, and so on and so forth, and then add Uber and Lyft, and pretty soon all the vehicles that you see are going to be fleet vehicles. Uh, and so uh, they are willing to pay for infrastructure, but we are a young company. We still have a lot to prove, uh, and so I'm sharing what we have learned, but we still have uh, many proof points until we can say that this is a sustainable business, for sure. Yes? Um, so throughout your experiences as entrepreneurs, have you noticed any uh, major differences between academically oriented uh, entrepreneurs and non-academic entrepreneurs? Um, it's a hard question because uh, most of my experience has been with, um, I guess, academic-oriented entrepreneurs, although Flagon, of course, had a number of people who came from, purely from industry, a lot of people came from U.S. robotics, for example. And uh, 
I don't think there's uh, a big difference. One of the differences that, from my perspective, is on the academic side, very often people are very enamored of the, you know, the kernel technological idea that, you know, that the company is based on, or, or they have some particular capability that they think is very special, and, and they're kind of um, attached to that. Whereas uh, very often, uh, someone who doesn't have an academic background is really interested in, in building the business, and so they're much more focused on the needs of the business, and that's actually an asset. So um, the academic background can bring you knowledge and maybe a capability that will give you an advantage, but it can also become a handicap if, you, if you're sort of wedded to it too much. That's my... No, you don't want to comment? I would love to hear your opinion about <laughs> I think Tom uh, really covered it, but, but the one advantage academics, if the business doesn't work, it can still go back to a job, so that's, that's always helpful. Uh, but no, I think it, it is true. I, that's why I think one of the things we've seen is many times the successful teams, uh, they, they team up. I mean, they have definitely have an academic, but uh, you, know, you team up with somebody who is more pragmatic, has more of a business sense, can go even present an idea and get money. And so there's a variety of skill sets that you want to have on your team, and so I, uh, We've actually funded a bunch of companies that were purely academic, and I think we saw that once we teamed them up with others uh, who come from a different background, it actually works out very well in terms of taking the idea to market. So I think uh, clearly great at solving problems and, uh, and, and getting the technology to work, but then there may be a different skill set required to take it to market. And you know, some, of, some folks are blessed with both. It's not like you always have this, uh, uh, you have to team up, but it's, you just understand your limitations, and as long as you do that, you bring the right people to your team, then you're fine. So one question that arose while I was fundraising, uh, and to give you an idea, by now I've had uh, more than 70 meetings with more than 50 different investor, angel investors and VCs while fundraising for, for um, the various steps of the way. Uh, one question is, you're a professor, you're tenured, uh, you have such a comfortable position in university, you know, uh, are you really willing to take this uh, risk and just give up all of that? Um, and it is a, a huge step in that, you know, I just coming here, I've, I've been in this community for 15 years now, and, and so you, 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 know, you, you know a lot of people, you know how uh, to write papers that get accepted and how to write grants that get funded, and you know, but at the end of the day, I think uh, uh, if, if w w the question is, is ill posed in, in that it, once someone decides to take this step, uh, it's because you see uh, uh, the opportunity to have an impact that goes even beyond the impact that you can have as a researcher and as a scientist. And for me, it was also about the pace. It's just no matter what, how we try, university will always be much slower than a startup by definition. And, and it's fine. It's just that at some point, I just couldn't handle it anymore. I just wanted to see things on the ground and I just wanted to have a real impact and, and see users using our technology. And so if you feel that drive uh, and, if, and if university just feels a little bit too slow for you, then I think entrepreneurship is a, a great opportunity to have real impact. Another question? Yes. I'll go, I'll go. I'm a full service moderator. So, uh, so this question is for, uh, for you from Qualcomm Ventures. Uh, what exactly is your hit rate? So you said uh, you funded about like approximately 130 companies. How many do you see making it? How many don't? And can you identify what makes a company work and what doesn't? Or, that's a So I, I, let me see. The, the question was, uh, what's the success ratio, sort of, and then can I identify whether a company makes it or not? Well, if I could, then I wouldn't be sitting here, by the way. I would, I would, I would be comfortably retired at this point in time. No, no, I think it, it is much more of an art than a science in terms of figuring out uh, what works. What, what VCs do best is pattern matching, so I think what we can do is we can say what doesn't work, typically. That's, uh, we do learn from past mistakes, so if you have done something that doesn't work and uh, we'll see the same pattern, typically we'll shy away from that. So that is, is more easy to do than to figure out what actually works. Typically what works is great teams and I think you know, we've, we, that's been talked about a lot. In terms of success ratio, it doesn't take a lot. So I mean one, uh, one of the questions talked about ways. We were early funders of ways and 
again, that kind of success uh, being bought by Google for a billion nowadays, you know, it, those things are, but those are all it takes. You need a few of those and they actually account for or they take away all the failures. Really, it's not a business where you have, the, the, the success rate is, you know, two, one to two out of 10 are big ones. You may have three to four that uh, are, we call, you know, two to three times return money and then a bunch of them fail. So there's a lot of mortality in, in this business. But you don't need to be successful, you need a few of them to succeed. And we're reaching the end of our time slot and our panel. Uh, just a final word uh, on, on uh, uh, the word entrepreneur or entrepreneur. It's very well chosen because entrepreneurship is all about dealing with uncertainty and just like information theory. So we hope that with the session yesterday and today's session, uh, many of you uh, will uh, gather the courage to, to try it and we wish you all the best. Thank you to the panelists and thank you to all of you for attending.